thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America, and today we're talking science. Dr. Ray Wynn Grant is a scientist at the Museum of Natural History. She currently studies a small population of American black bear in the western U.S. Uh, she's worked, though, on similar research questions with lemurs in Madagascar, African lions in rural Kenya and Tanzania, as well as grizzly bears in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. She is also a great storyteller. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having today. me. Today, it's really, and we were talking about these grizzlies. You say that they could weigh a thousand pounds? Easily a thousand Easily. pounds. Easily. They're humongous creatures, some uh, of the biggest we have on the continent. Some of the biggest, and yet, you know, you just love them. You're <laughs> <laughs> out there. Um, talk to us a little bit uh, about yourself, but before you do, I want to. In reading your bios, I came across this quote. It says, she's also unapologetic about her passion for studying charismatic megafauna. What, for the non-scientists of us, does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, so that's definitely a biology joke, and so any biologist out there gets it. But charismatic megafauna, charismatic, of course, is, you know, fun and interesting and beautiful and engaging, and megafauna are just large animals. Fauna being animals, <laughs> mega being huge. So it's the elephants, the giraffes, the bears, the moose and the gazelles and the rhinos of the world. Um, there are those of us who are just unapologetic about our love for the really big animals. And then there are biologists who study bacteria and they study the really <laughs> tiny microorganisms tiny that are equally as important. Okay, great. Now that we've cleared that up, <laughs> you know, thank you. Um, tell us how you got to this point. We always start by asking our guests the influences in your childhood. What brought you to this particular platform? Certainly. Well, I would say that most of my colleagues came into the environmental sciences or studying wildlife through adventures in the outdoors when they were young. And I had a really different experience. So I grew up in big cities with city parents, urban dwelling black parents, and we didn't spend time in the outdoors. So there was no hiking and camping and fishing and hunting and all of that on the weekend. Right. None of those trips. Um, but what I did do a lot of was watch TV. I yeah. think a lot of city kids can relate to that. So I would be glued to the TV when there was a nature show on. Um, and I'm fortunate that all throughout my childhood on PBS and Discovery and Animal Planet and all those channels, there would be these fantastic nature shows where hosts would be in the wilderness in these remote areas handling wildlife and showing us peeks into um, the behavior of animals. And I thought it was fascinating. It just always hooked me. Well, now, education-wise, you swept through Emory, Yale, and Columbia getting your doctorate, right? So... Well, I don't know if it was a sweep we... through. <laughs> that makes it sound like there weren't the ups and downs and the hills and valleys of which there definitely were. But it feels great to be at a place now to say, yeah, I have these degrees behind me. They're all in ecology or environmental sciences, and it's positioned me to be um, a wildlife biologist and, now. And what exactly did your urban parents say about this choice of profession? <laughs> you know, they are very supportive. So I have to say, neither of my parents are scientists, of course, and they don't have backgrounds in science or, you know, this inherent love for nature necessarily. But they were always really supportive of me getting an education in whatever I wanted. And science is pretty appealing, I think, to a lot of parents out there. So they definitely encouraged me once I found the passion for science. But it definitely took me a long time to realize that I wanted to be a scientist. Yeah, you said that you were actually in college before you decided that that was a professional career, right? Yeah, that's And you correct. met, I read that you met an environmentalist and, you know, were swept away by seeing another black person who was an environmentalist mm -hmm. and encouraging mm -hmm. you to join this field. That's exactly Talk a little what bit happened, about, yeah. yeah. So I, I went to Emory University for my undergraduate education and loved it right away, but spent a couple years being pretty lost as to what on earth I would get a major in. Um, I entered school thinking there's a good biology department here, maybe I'll be pre-med and maybe mm -hmm. I'll be a physician, a doctor. Um, and that's what tons of people were doing and a lot of my black peers at Emory were doing that too. Um, but I didn't love it, you know, it's the microbiology, so it's looking at what happens inside of an organism, right, right. how that works, right. and that didn't hook me. And I had a bit of a crisis. I thought, do I want to do music or do I want to do journalism? Should I learn a language? I'm completely lost here. 
And one day I was at, you know, one of those fairs that yeah. the different departments have to advertise what they offer. And there was a black staff member, and he wasn't a professor, but he worked in the environmental okay. science department. And he chatted with me for a little bit about my interests. And after listening to me for about five minutes, he said, you know, you should really consider environmental studies. And I remember very vividly saying, what is that? <laughs> I've never heard of that ever before, you know? And he said, just give it a shot. It's a, it's a major here, and I think it's perfect for you. And I started in environmental studies, and I still didn't like it. I, no. I didn't, you know, I trusted him because I thought he saw me, he was black, he was offering this alternative path. And I started there and I didn't like it. Some of it was intimidation. I was the only black student um, at the time in the department. I was the only black student they had ever had in the department. Um, and so I felt intimidated being in this, you know, going sure, from- Sure, pioneering, right? Pioneering, yeah, I right. wasn't, I didn't have the confidence yet to do that. Right. Um, so there was that discomfort, but also I felt that so many of the students there had a background already in the environment, you know? So they were the students who had grown up going hiking and camping and hunting and sure. fishing and understanding nature in that way. And I just didn't get it, you know, reading the pages of a book and studying for tests. And what I decided to do, because it was getting late in college to change my major again, was to do a really intense study abroad experience. So I said, Ray, what you're gonna do is do the most extreme environmental science study abroad experience. And if you still hate it after that, then you can quit, but you need to at least go this far. And so I signed up for an opportunity in Kenya mm -hmm. and it was um, a wildlife management semester abroad. And it was living in a tribal Maasai community. Sure, sure. Basically camping sure. amongst tons of wildlife. Um, and it was taught by all black Kenyan professors. And that was the, that was the tipping point. And, and that was the tipping point. So I, I honestly, I was 20 years old and I flew to Kenya, right. um, you know, to meet this group. And, you know, we got off the plane, we got in the Jeeps and we start driving out to the field and just on that drive for the first time in my whole life, I saw wild animals. Mm -hmm. So there were the giraffes and there were the elephants yeah. and there were the antelopes and the gazelles and the zebra. And, you know, the other students I was with had seen wildlife before, but I hadn't. And it was at that moment, I'll never forget, that I realized this is the part of environmental science that I love. It's animals. It's wild animals in their natural habitat. This is it. This is for me. And I never looked back. You never looked back. But now tell us again how you fell in love with black bear. <laughs> So yeah, it's a big You're difference a from African wildlife, right. of course. Right. Um, black bears are fascinating, and I spent uh, many, many years studying African wildlife. Um, and when I entered my PhD, I was really interested in applying some questions about how humans and wildlife interact and might have conflicts with one another. And I needed to do a long-term study. And that's difficult to do with endangered species like lions that I had been studying before because they really need urgent protection. And I had amazing mentors when I entered my PhD, just the best advisors I could possibly ask for. And they encouraged me to think about, you know, taking a little break from the African context and applying some of my research questions to North America, where there are big populations of carnivores that aren't endangered. And so I got hooked up with this amazing black bear project and right. haven't looked back again. Right. So it, it's interesting that you talk about the conflict mm -hmm. because that's the, spe the specialization. I mean, there may be others, you know, and I call you the Jane Goodall of black bears. And that right? is the biggest compliment <laughs> I could ever ask for. You know, I mean, really, I see you living among the black bear, you know, and I think we have some pictures up now and here you are. Tell us this beautiful animal you are cuddled up uh i am yeah it's worth mentioning that in any of the pictures you show the bears are sleeping so they're tranquilized tranquilized so the right. thing that i do first is to shoot them with a tranquilizer gun in order to handle them um, and get the data that i need and so they're asleep for about an hour um, sometimes a little bit longer and then they wake back up and that's the only safe way for me to take a picture like this with such a huge animal. Right, and the area, and I see you've wrapped the, uh, uh, what kind of data are you looking for? Absolutely, on this bear, this is a female uh, large black bear. 
um, in hibernating. So she's halfway ah, into her den. Ah, this is I the see. winter. This was in February. And so she's doing her, you know, winter hibernation. Okay. And she's wearing a collar that's not unlike a dog collar, but it has a device on mm -hmm. the bottom. And that's a GPS, so a geographic positioning system. And it gives satellite data. So it, connect, it connects to a satellite in outer space. And then that satellite sends a signal back to my computer. And that gives me the location of the bear at all times. That location helps me do things like find her when she's hibernating. Interesting. I, uh, there is a video of you giving a lecture about your beloved black bears. Uh, you're in Nevada, uh, and you're talking about the population around a lake. Mm -hmm. And this, we'll t on the other side of it, we'll talk more about the conflict that you talk about between these bears and people who also live there. Let's take a look at the video. So when we go back to looking at the spatial distribution of conflicts, so what parts of the landscape are they happening? I'll reintroduce you to where we are in the landscape in the western United States. And then if we zoom in on Lake Tahoe, you can see the different uh, pink dots on parts of the lake indicate locations of bear conflicts in terms of bears raiding trash cans. And what we've been able to find over time is that there are hot spots of these conflicts. So if you'll notice in the northern tip of the lake, there's an area called Incline Village. And that's a, that's a, a small town full of people. And it seems to be a hot spot for bears feeding on garbage. And what's notable about this hot spot is that all around the lake and all around the eastern portions of the lake where I'm doing my work, there is tremendous human development. So it's not just a high human population density in Incline Village, it's all the way surrounding the lake. And so there must be something either ecological or something social about that area that is contributing to the high incidence of conflict there. So exactly what kind of conflict are we talking about? You know, we envision this hand-to-hand -hand whatever, but you're talking about covered trash cans, right? Uh, tell us a little bit about the conflict. Absolutely. So to be clear, sometimes people have really unfortunate and fairly dangerous conflicts with bears in the United States. It's very infrequent, but there are attacks that happen periodically. But what I'm studying are the very frequent conflicts, and that is when bears just come into town and get into people's garbage at night and even knock them over, do a little property damage and destruction. Right. It's really, really common, not just in the West, but even here in New York. Even here in New York. And I mean New York State, not New York City, because we don't have any bears here. But New York State Thanks has- Thanks for clearing that yeah, up. Yeah, there's right. about 10,000 or so yeah. bears here in the state of New York, and you know, they're not too far from the city. In another part of the video that I was watching with you giving your lecture, you were talking about the decrease in the population of the bears around the lake. How many bears are we talking about? So in my study area in Nevada, there's about 400 to 500 estimated um, individual bears in that region. So contrasting to New York, where there are you know, tens of thousands, it's a huge difference. So it's a very small population. At one point, there were zero bears in Nevada. So really? they were um, extirpated from the region. They went locally extinct there. Um, and so now they're rebounding after over 100 years of being gone. Really? And, and are they doing that naturally without uh, help from scientists? They yeah. just are recurring. Yes. It is what we call a conservation success story. So we don't get a lot of them. Usually we find that species continue to be endangered and go extinct. But in terms of black bears in the United States, it's actually a success story that we're proud to talk about in terms of how the populations are rebounding. So. Recently, 13 federal agencies just came out with their climate report saying that humans do indeed have some part in the decaying of our climate health. Exactly how does that affect your bears? Yeah, absolutely. It affects bears um, directly in terms of the way that they operate and behave in the environment, and it affects them indirectly in terms of the prey that they eat, right? So when climate change impacts grass, you know, and plants, that impacts deer, and bear eat deer. And so there is the, that tiered system of impacts. But the most obvious way is in terms of hibernating. So bears hibernate in the winter. The ones that I work with use environmental cues so meaning when the temperature drops to a certain level and when snowfall piles up to a certain level, their body tells them it's time to shut down for hibernation. 
And if we see changes in the environment, if there's less snow or maybe no snow, if the temperature doesn't drop at the right time in November, December, they might not get the environmental cues to hibernate. And if they don't go into hibernation, they will actually starve to death because they don't have access to the food they need. Wow, wow. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. really, it can be a really tragic and tremendous issue with wildlife and climate change, right. let alone people and climate change. Right, right. So talk to me, uh, you're a successful black woman scientist. Talk to me about what you see in STEM with young girls coming up who, how do we get them to follow your, follow your path? <laughs> Simple question. Solve this for us. Put these girls I, in the pipeline. I wish I had all of the answers. And, you know, to be completely honest and frank, I don't necessarily want girls to follow my direct path because it had a lot of valleys that I hope that no one ever has to repeat. Um, when I was in high school, um, I've begun saying publicly that I didn't get very good grades, um, and in particular in my science and math classes. I was performing Why do you think that was? fairly poorly. You know, there are a lot of reasons. Yeah. A lot of them have to do with where my self-confidence was mm -hmm. as a teenager. Mm -hmm. That's something that many sure. girls will struggle with and many black people will struggle with. Um, I also moved with my family across the country and entered a new school system. Sure. And um, the culture of the high school that I went to spoke to that um, achievement gap the racially based achievement gap. You felt and you were not getting a very good education where you were. I fell into it. So yeah. it seemed that right. the culture of the school perpetuated this idea that black students were underachievers, right. white students were expected to achieve. And as a confused adolescent, I absolutely fell into that and mm -hmm. never ever thought I'm smart, I'm good at science, I'm good at math, I have a future in this. Um, and although I had supportive parents at home, you know, they encouraged me to do the things that I was excelling at, which at the time was music. Right. And so there was no, there was no um, feeling that I would go on to be a scholar in the sciences at all. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want other girls to go through that. I don't want girls to get bad grades. I don't want, you know, other black students to go through those But hardships. to recognize, you know, that, the, that, that these other factors are pressing on them. You and know, to recognize I'm, that, you know, just because you're not excelling in something doesn't mean you have to get rid of a passion for it. So I loved science, but I was getting, you know, the D grades in science. Right. And I'm really just glad, and what I would emphasize to, to girls and minorities in STEM is to keep that passion. Don't mm -hmm. confuse passion with performance, ah. perhaps. And that can help you just stay the course. Right, right. Now, uh, you have um, uh, a photograph that you posted on Instagram or in your social media of you in front of the Hidden Figures poster, uh, you and a friend, and what that, that movie and that book meant to you. I mean, this is the, it's a great, it's a great photograph. You guys are, I mean, you're the embodiment, uh, you know, this century's, you know, Hidden Figures. Yeah, absolutely. And th my friend in the picture is Cynthia Malone, and she is a PhD student at the University of Toronto studying the environmental sciences and social justice at the same time. So she's truly a pioneer. I have to give her a shout out. Um, but I think the caption that I put in this photo was, this is what it looks like when black women see movies, or when black women in science see movies about black women Women's. in science, <laughs> right? And it's so unfortunate that we're seeing a movie about, you know, what happened decades ago and the black women in science decades ago, because we're still here. You know, we're in the shadows, I would definitely say, but we're, we're still here. And the joy and the pride that I saw watching that movie and then subsequently learning about all the current day mm -hmm. hidden figures, mm -hmm. it's one of the things that keeps me going in my profession even today. Uh, we should talk a little bit about the danger that your profession <laughs> provides to you. We have a photograph of you washing your face, another post. <laughs> yes, uh, tell us what's going on here and what happens next. Yeah, certainly this picture is from the tropics. So I was in Central America um, two months ago. And, you know, in this picture, I'm just getting finished with a long day of field work and it's hot and I'm sweaty and it's all the unglamorous things that I try <laughs> not to show too much of. Um, but, you know, one of the tiny dangers is disease. Mm. And so, you know, people see lions and bears that I'm working with and they think, oh my goodness, aren't you afraid? Isn't that dangerous to you? And I'm thinking, 
you know, the, the tiny things, the microscopic things like bacteria and parasites and diseases or even insects and snakes and the little things yeah. are the ones that actually and, pose the biggest threat day to day. And, and something got you that day, right? Something but, got me that day, unfortunately. <laughs> I won't give you the details of what it turned out to be, but it wasn't pretty, I'll tell you that. And you've also taken your two-year-old daughter on, on trips. She was on this trip with you? Certainly. Look at that. So that, oh. that is my little one. Oh. Uh, her name is Zuri, and she is two. Right. Um, for sure, a big struggle that I had when I was pregnant and when I gave birth and was a new mother was figuring out how to be a wildlife biologist who mm -hmm. works in these remote locations with large animals um, and be a good and present mother. I have an incredibly supportive husband, so that support system means the world. And right. most of the time I leave Zuri at home. <laughs> but in this instance, we weren't able to do that. He had a work trip, we didn't have a babysitter, and I took her to Panama with me. Um, she didn't, you know, she didn't interact with the jaguars and everything that I was working with. I was going to say you all were then looking for jaguars, right? She got a taste of the tropics, and it helped me to understand what I'm capable of. You know, I'm always learning how to be a mother. And so it helped me learn I can be a mom and I can be a scientist and I can be good at both things at the same time. And I don't have a lot of examples of that in my life. So it was really pivotal. Right. So t at, the, at the Museum of Natural History, you do the lectures and you do mentoring. And tell us a little bit about that, of, you know, the young people coming through there and seeing the image of you as the scientist, mm -hmm. as in charge, mm -hmm. talking about your work. Sure. So most of what I do at the Natural History Museum is my own research. But I'm so fortunate because the museum has a number of wonderful programs for New York City youth. Mm -hmm. And so there are, many of them are free. Um, the one that I work with the most is called the Science Research Mentoring Program. And it actually handpicks um, students from New York City public and private schools to come into the museum and get paid to do research with a real scientist in the museum. And so I am able to pick a couple of students every year and work very closely with them. Um, you know, I, I've always worked with students of color, young students of color from New York and work really closely with, the, with, closely, excuse me, with them on black bear research and mm -hmm. it's exposing them to so many new things. I mean, first of all, just having a space, a workspace at this, uh, such an esteemed sure. institution sure. is a really big deal. We pay them a salary so they don't have to choose between having an after school job and doing this research. And I just walk them through a lot of the basics. A lot of the things that I didn't learn how to do until graduate school, they're learning at such an early age. And I hope that I am able to show them that they can see themselves in an institution and in a career like this. Terrific. Well, since I call you the Jane Goodall of the black of the black bear, do you name them? <laughs> <laughs> we do name our bears. Yes. We do. You know, I have to say that the bear research project that I'm a part of got started long before I joined it, and so most of the bears were named by my colleagues, and they're named after football players. So football you know, players. Football players. So. <laughs> You know, if it's up to me, I might choose a Beyonce or something, but football right. players for now. Great. So the, the future of, um, uh, of this country or globally and having participants in, in, in the sciences, I know we keep struggling with girls and with, with people, young children, students of color, mm -hmm. you know, going into the sciences. Are you optimistic by what you see? Oh, wow, that's a heavy question. I, I remain optimistic. Mm -hmm. um, I know that in so many ways, I had to break through tons of barriers that were completely unfair. And at the same time, I know that I had tremendous privilege in a lot of other ways. I had very educated parents and you know, a, enough of a socioeconomic support base that I didn't have to worry about poverty and food day to day. Mm -hmm. And it's those things that absolutely trump, you know, whether a student performs well in the sciences. So if I were to be concerned about anything, it's about our community mm -hmm. and how we are doing in terms of just having the basic necessities for students to perform well in anything. But in terms of the students who might have that foundation already and hopefully can get involved in science, 
seeing faces like mm -hmm. mine, like uh, you have Neil deGrasse Tyson, I think, behind yes. me. Seeing okay. faces like nice uh, like them. Positioning. <laughs> it's say. perfect. We work together <laughs> at the museum. Um, yeah. It really helps. You know, there's this there's this adage that if you can't see it, you can't become it. And I want to make sure that people are able to see themselves in these fields. Right. Well, as, as we come to the close of our program, we always ask our guests to finish the statement, the power of the strength of black America lies in. How would you answer Gosh. that? The power, the strength of black America absolutely lies in our resistance and our resilience. Ex expand on that a bit because you have had to be resilient in your own life, in your own profession. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about the, the um, being black and, and how that affects. Sure, yeah, well, the reason I, I thought of resistance first is that um, what I find encouraging is that every single person can find their own way to resist white supremacy or resist oppression. And whether it's being an advocate, um, you know, and, and being on the front lines of these movements, that's a tremendous way to do it. Or whether it's someone like my colleague behind me who really builds an incredible profile and achieves, achieves, achieves to be present and powerful in a space in order to make change, um, that's a different act of resistance. And both ways are valid and everything in between. And I love the way that over time, you know, black Americans have always found their own personal way to resist oppression. Resilience is what we do best. So despite all of the horrible things that historically right. and currently are impacting us, um, black Americans are the most resilient. You know, in general, we show so much love and caring and happiness and fortitude and strength. And my ancestors, what they've been through, my contemporaries, what we're going through, are all the groups of people that inspire me. Well, we thank you so much for being with us. We're so optimistic. I'm optimistic about your future. <laughs> thank you. And what you. you will add to, to the sciences and to our understanding of it. So thank you so much for your, for your work and for being with us here today. Thank you so much, okay. Carol. And thanks for you all out there uh, watching us as well. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America, and we will see you the next time.